My Vote Mackinac is brought to you by DTE Energy Foundation, ITC Holdings Corp., the Masco Corporation Foundation, PVS Chemicals, and by the Shirley and Bill Fox Fund. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. We are here in the parlor of the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, the site of the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference. Much of today's conversation on the island centered on Detroit. Coming up, I'll talk auto insurance rates and education with Mayor Mike Duggan. Also coming up, the key players in Detroit's bankruptcy case talk about the city's future plus a frank discussion about racial equity as Detroit moves forward with its rebirth. And TV host Mike Rowe shares his ideas on how Michigan can grow its economy. It is all coming up. But we do begin with Detroit. Mayor Mike Duggan's primary focus these days is on lowering auto insurance rates for Detroiters, and he's asking state lawmakers to approve a cheaper plan. I talked with the mayor about his de-insurance proposal. So you're up here at the Mackinac Policy Conference for the first time post-emergency manager. Do you view this as an opportunity to sell Detroit or really tell Detroit's story? You know, I've been coming to this for uh, well over 25 years. There were years where uh, we were uh, convincing people to build a baseball and a football stadium in yeah. Detroit. There were uh, times we were convincing people to support us on an airport expansion. And uh, right now, as much as anything else, uh, I'm trying to get legislators to go along with uh, a car insurance reform because we've got to cut the cost of car insurance in Detroit. You testified earlier this week in Lansing. What was the reaction of legislators up there? I think it was very good, and uh, the Senate Insurance Committee is going to hold their vote uh, this coming week. Uh, and I'm optimistic we're going to get it out of committee. So uh, it's going to be hopefully progress. Some lawmakers were talking about, well, if we do this for Detroit, we'd have to do this. Uh, we'd have to do this for other areas in Michigan. What would your what would your I'm, counter be to that? I, I would say I'm happy if it's done for everybody. But right now, the average cost of, of insuring a car in Detroit is three thousand four hundred dollars. In the suburbs, that same car is being insured for seventeen hundred dollars. And the difference is entirely in the health care costs uh, and what's going on in the system. It's not anything else. It's not fair. And so I proposed an option where Detroiters could buy lower health care coverage and be the same as 49 other states uh, and save $1,000 each. Or they can keep buying the, the, the full benefit policy if they want. Just give Detroiters an option. If legislators want to give everybody an option, it's fine with me but the impact will be far greater on Detroit. You've had to have a very good relationship with Lansing or start to work with them very much because not only of this reform that you're talking about, you're also now talking about education and, sure. and really giving more of your vision of how you think DPS should be shaped or all the schools in general in Detroit. Talk to me a little bit about what your thoughts are in terms of education, how that goes along with Governor Snyder's layout that he has done and how it maybe differs from what the coalition has said. Well, you know, I, I think what the coalition did was just outstanding, to have those 30 individuals spend that huge amount of time and come out with, I think, excellent recommendations. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. I, I, I'm, as far as the governor's decision to take the old debt, which was run up under the state emergency managers, everybody acknowledges it's the state's responsibility, and put that in a separate corporation, I think that's fine. Give the uh, schools a fresh start. But I also think the people of Detroit need to be able to elect a school board, just like every other uh, city in this state. And I think if you held a new school board election in the next year, the best and brightest of Detroit would come out and run. Uh, I think people would get excited, and we start to get kids enrolling in the Detroit public schools again, and that's the direction I'm pushing. But you're also pushing for uh, some kind of financial review board as well to be able to oversee what's you, happening with the school board. You know, I'm not necessarily pushing it, but I'm trying to find a compromise. So the governor says, okay, if we're going to pay off this past debt, how is the state assured it's not run up again? Well, the, the agreement we reached coming out of bankruptcy is that I report to a financial review commission. I monthly show them we're on budget, they approve contracts, and after we balance our budget for three years, they go away. I think it would be reasonable to say for the new school board to have the same thing for a period of time. And so I propose that as a middle ground because I think it's absolutely essential Detroiters get a chance to elect their own school board. You know, what do you say to parents who are, are watching this, kind of jockeying back and forth and trying to figure out what the exact final plan for DPS is going to be and they're waiting to enroll their kids for the fall? What would you tell them? 
Yeah, I don't think anybody's waiting. Uh, Detroiters, I mean, it's been chaos since the emergency manager took over. We've had, of the 200 schools in Detroit, 160 have opened and closed in the last six years, which has just been a, had a devastating effect on education. Uh, and so parents are making decisions between the school their child is in and the alternative schools they can afford to get to. And most charters are not offering transportation. So for the third of the families in our city that don't have a car, they pretty much don't have a choice. Uh, and so Detroiters understand full well what's going on and I'm trying to get to a system where we provide transportation so you have a choice, we provide you information on the schools so you can make that choice, and ultimately uh, that we have an authority that controls the opening and closing of schools to make it rational. Uh, so I'm grinding away at it. So two big issues for Detroiters right now, high auto insurance rates and education. And I would argue to add a third there is also crime. Joining us now are our contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, it's good to see you on day two of the Mackinac Policy yes. Conference. It's good to be here. You remember that time we did the fudge tasting? Yes, we did. I don't want to do that again. I don't like fudge. Why don't you like fudge? It's not good. I was thinking that would be sweet. a good... Good Are you kidding me? Yeah, no. I, do you live That's in Michigan? That's the point of fudge. Not a fan. Fudge is supposed to be sweet. I have a consistency issue with it. Chocolate walnut, and anyway. that's just me. But anyway, all right. Let's <laughs> that, that wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing to add that to one of our shows. trying to tell us somebody will get you some fudge. Is that what you want? Well, no, but that was nice <laughs> that time. All right. Let's talk about Mayor Mike Duggan. You're, okay. you're, now I'm, and all I can think about is fudge. But let's talk about what his role has been here at the conference. He gave a very popular keynote speech, and um, the buzz around him is is very is very large. I'm going to start with you, Stephen. What would you say his role is here? Well, I mean, I think first of all, that was a surprise speech, and I think even among his staff, they did not expect him to talk as much about schools as he did, or to go as far as he did in in making the point uh, that that he made, which is that. Uh, in, in some, return Detroit schools to Detroiters and do it soon, uh, and we will prove that we can govern our schools but with ourselves some with some oversight, with some the same oversight that he lives with every day in City Hall now. Uh, that that financial oversight board, uh, that's a really different message than we've heard come out of any of the talks about uh, school reform, and it and it sort of triangulates a little, uh, trying to remove state oversight as a political issue in the city of Detroit uh, and give take away the thing that people could just run against and not talk about improving schools and improving outcomes for kids. What do you think, Nolan? I think he showed some real leadership um, on this issue, an issue that he had dodged and, and, and had hoped to keep dodging. But I think he saw where this was headed, and it was, it was headed nowhere. And in one sense, you could say he stepped up and pulled the governor's cookies out of the fire here because the governor had no support in Detroit little support in the legislature but beyond the speech i saw him out on the porch today uh lobbying phil pavlov the yes. senate education uh -huh. chair mm -hmm. um so he's working for a plan he's trying because the legislature is going to decide this and you know if he's going to put his uh you know effort out and in, in swaying the legislature that's doing one big favor there's to Rick no question Snyder. there's no question that he is a little frustrated and his staff has been frustrated with the pace at which uh, this has gotten done yeah. uh, w with the governor in charge. Uh, I I'm not sure that what he's proposing makes it any easier, but it may rest the sort of uh, center of the conversation into his lap uh, more where, than you know, where you know, and, and that's an important thing because you know you, you could sit back there and, and and say and watch this thing keep imploding mm -hmm. and nothing happen but this is his city at stake and okay. if you're going to say give us control and we will fix it we, we will, will make it, it right and that's on him now and that's yeah. what i got out of it was after so many months of saying i'm, I'm kind of on the edge of this i've got so many other things that i need to take care of before i wade into the schools i don't want to have total control over the schools for him to come up with some kind of hybrid between the coalition and the governor yeah. is is very interesting and very poignant here let me ask you this does he is he going to be able to make enough friends in a quickly in a quick amount of time to be able to, to get this done? Well, I, I, I'm not sure of that. I think uh, the, the the appetite for the governor's plan with this uh, uh, the money, the $53 million, $50 a student from each school district in the state to pay for DPS debt is a real stumbling block. There is no appetite, apparently, in the legislature to do that or to even have to try to sell that. Uh, so where, so does the, where does the money come from? I'm not well, sure. I mean... Uh, that's a big question. It's 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 going to have to come from the from the school aid fund, I think. But but what what this move does was is he you know he took one enemy away 
from this plan, from the governor's plan. If the governor will sign on here, and I expect he will, he takes one opponent away, and that is the, the city of Detroit and the Education Coalition. So now he has some unity in going to the legislature. I mean, before he couldn't even bring the Detroit lawmakers to the table and say, hey, work for this And, and think of, you know, one of the things that really agitated uh, people in the city administration was when the governor came out and said, well, here's the structure I want for governance, and I will have more appointees yeah. to it than, than any of you will. Uh, the, the mayor said earlier today to me, Lansing does not know Detroit, does not understand Detroit, and doesn't understand the political dynamic here at all, and so we've got to change that quickly before we can get anything done on this. Another headline that came out uh, about the mayor is when he was asked if he was going to run for governor, and it was no way, <laughs> no how. Leave me alone. Don't even ask me again about it. All right, so, so let's go back, what, four years to when Mike Duggan bought a house in Palmer Woods uh, before he had announced anything about political aspirations, and everyone asked, are you doing this to run for mayor and he said no my kids are out of the house this is an opportunity I have no interest in the job so let's take it with uh, see, see, you that don't quite, you don't quite believe absolutely the, uh, not I don't think it me I mean he may or may not run for governor I don't know if he's, he's gonna not run for governor, for governor or not you just made weird eyebrows but I don't Nolan. think this I don't think him <laughs> saying emphatically that he won't uh, can be taken can be taken all serious. right last word he's Nolan. not running for governor I don't think he was ever running for governor I think he's got different designs I think he wants to be the political boss get a Democratic governor elected, and pull the strings from Detroit. I think he's much better <laughs> suited to that role than he would be to being governor. But All would right. you, I mean, would you, you, you have to agree that he might uh, come to see that he can do more of what he needs to do in the city of Detroit as, as governor, governor no. than he can as mayor. mayor. Because a lot of it has to do with money. Yeah, if you if he gets a Democratic governor exactly. in office, then he can, then he's well, got it all. Maybe. Or if he, if he, no, I think the only way he'd take it is if he was assured of a Democratic legislature. I don't think he has any appetite well, has, yeah, of going up there and busting his head. Guys, right? I mean, the Republican governor can't get his agenda through. No. So I, I, he's not running for governor. All right, well, moving <laughs> on. Right, well, keep moving, that tape. Moving now. On. Keep that we'll tape. Keep that tape. <laughs> moving on. Detroit's future after bankruptcy was also a big topic today, although there are challenges to overcome. The architects of the historic grand bargain agree that Detroit is poised for prosperity. Take a look. When I see some of the leadership of the city here in the audience today, for instance, and they're doing an exceptional job of, of keeping on track. In fact, the uh, measures that we had in our plan of adjustment either being met or exceeded. I think that's tremendous. Um, I think the level of cooperation regionally, I hope, continues for a number of different issues, water, transportation, whatever along those lines. Heard the prior speaker speaking about that. Um, but I think one of the things, in fact, that the uh, policy conference did was they added a session on inclusion. And I think that's, that's a tremendous issue. I wanted to, to focus the people of the city of Detroit on their responsibilities as members of our democratic society, that, that ultimately the success of our democracy depends on them. Uh, sure, the leaders are responsible, but it's up to the people to hold the leaders accountable and responsible. Uh, and uh, more, than, more than, than that, it's also their responsibility uh, to assist their leaders in the revitalization of the city. Wherever I am in the world, this city, mm -hmm. for some reason, is associated with the American brand. Yeah. And I always say, what happens in Detroit matters to America. This was a very interesting session to hear all of these men sitting together. So what has to happen to keep Detroit <coughs> on the path to success? Stephen, let me ask you that first. Well, I mean, you got to uh, back to the fundamentals, blocking and tackling, right? You've got to deliver city services uh, in neighborhoods better than you did before with whatever money you've gotten freed up through the bankruptcy. And you got to be disciplined. You cannot slip back into the, into the old uh, ways of doing things. And I think uh, five, six months into it, Mayor Duggan seems to be doing that. He's not over-promising. He's been very realistic about telling people this is going to take a long time. Every neighborhood is not going to see immediate improvements or changes because there's not money for that or plans, uh, but that people need to be patient and that we are moving steadily in a positive direction. You know, Judge Rhodes also said, Nolan, we have to keep our leaders accountable. Is well, that yeah. a, a big part of it? Well, we do. we do. We can't go back to the days when everybody was um, grabbing everything they could get. You know, nobody was worrying about uh, whether the city was on track or not. But I think the key here is continuing to cultivate an environment, a climate, friendly to private investment. This 
comeback is being driven largely by private investors. You're not going to rebuild Detroit with public dollars, with tax pro pro um, dollars and government programs. Uh, you've got to keep private investors excited up about the Detroit, Detroit and convince them that there's money to be made here. And I think that's, that's going to be key, not just to downtown's revival, but also to the neighborhoods. You've got to make the neighborhoods attractive to investment. Would you agree that it's private investment that's going to drive this? I think it's private partner, uh, private public partnerships is going to be a lot of it. I mean, uh, you're not going, uh, you're, we're not at the, at the point yet where we can talk about uh, rational economic case private investment in most areas of Detroit. It doesn't work. The numbers don't work. Uh, you are always uh, in the short term going to have to have some sort of public uh, subsidy or or help to make those things work. Um, and again, the, the, the key for city government is translating those things into stuff that matters to the people who live in the neighborhoods, whether it's fixing in the neighborhoods uh, or not, it's got to be benefits that, that help them. Government needs to get its job right. If it will do the things you said, improve ser services, uh, reduce crime, make the neighborhoods livable, that's what government can do. You, they, it does those things. People will want to come here. Investors will want to put their money here. All right. opportunity. Well, you know, one of the questions that has emerged post-bankruptcy is whether there will be economic opportunity for all during Detroit's rebirth. Today, Nolan took part in a dialogue about racial equity, and I think it was very interesting. It was you, and it was also Devin Skillian from, from WDIV, right. um, Channel 4, who kind of hosted this, this town hall. There was some criticism coming up here that it's two white guys having this sure. conversation up on Mackinac <laughs> Island and yeah. not in Detroit, and I want to give you an opportunity to well, answer some you, of that criticism. I mean, you, are, you are white. I, you know, I, they told me that today. Well. I was kind of happy to learn that, though. <laughs> they, uh, you know, we were two guys um, holding the microphones. We never intended this to be our discussion. The panel was the audience, and we had a good, diverse audience, lots of great conversation, a lot of great comments. We tried to stay out of the way and let these folks share their stories, share their thoughts, share those ideas. Um, you know, it wasn't two white guys talking about race. <laughs> we were facilitating a conversation. I think it worked very well. You have these conversations happening in the city of Detroit. Stephen, why would you argue that it is actually important to have this conversation up on at Mackinac well, Island I with mean, this crowd well, of people? Well, for starters, all of the decision makers in the state are up here. Right. And to pr presume that you can deal with this problem in any meaningful way without them participating is, is craziness. Uh, you, need to, you need to convince business, you need to convince political elites that this is something worth talking about uh, uh, in explicit terms, in, in terms of saying, look, there are racial imbalances that have long historical uh, foundations uh, and lingering effects. Uh, let's let's talk about it and start to, to think more about how to deal with it. We're going to have another panel tomorrow talking about that, talking specifically about that business case that can be made for racial uh, equality. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. it, 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 it the, the critics of this are sort of acting as if this is the only thing that's being done. No one's saying that. No one's saying this is the only thing that needs to take place. But it is a part of the solution, and it's a part that has been missing for a really long time at gatherings like this. And as Shirley, I think Shirley Stancato put it best in our session when she said, you've got to have white people talking about this. And it's time white people started talking about this and noticing it. it and being concerned about it. That's where the fix is going to come from. That's where... Um, we'll start to get over these age-old problems. Well, changing some perceptions and maybe start looking in terms of hiring as well, which, yes. is, a, which is a key issue, I think, for a lot of these businesses who are coming into the city right now. Right. All right, well, there are still some parts of the city's bankruptcy exit plan that have not been completed. One is the creation of a regional water authority to oversee Detroit's water system. But Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle told me he's not sold on the deal yet. It all goes back to, I think, the lack of transparency and the concern that people have with public officials today. You know what? They just don't trust what's happening with their money. I look at Proposal 1, which is a prime example of my concern dealing with this actual water authority. Proposal 1, the people looked at it and thought, you know what? At least it was public discussion, you know, with the governor, the legislature branch. And uh, you know what? They realized what it was, and they just didn't like it because they didn't like where the money was going. Well, the same thing with the Great Lakes Water Authority was all behind closed doors, under a gag order, and people really don't understand what's happening, and it, it completely lack transparency, which it should not have done, because this is a vital issue for the entire region, and it's a, you know, it's a resource that all of us have to have, and it's water. 
All right, so the regional water deal has to be in place by June 14th. What are the chances that it will come together by then? Nolan, let me start with you. Mark Hackle says there's been no transparency and people have no idea what's going on with this thing. We've been talking about this now for a year. We were talking about yeah. this last year well, on Mackinac Island. Last year was years. where the, the memorandum of understanding sort Came of, out of. of mm -hmm. uh, got put together. And here we are a year later. Uh, both Hackle, Brooks Patterson are very upset that some of the terms have changed that were in that memorandum of understanding. I don't think they're going to get there by June 14th. There are really difficult problems and barriers still to get beyond. And I think Sean Cox, the judge, the federal judge who's overseeing negotiation, has hurt this process with his obsessiveness with secrecy and the gag order. And these folks can't vet this with their county commissions, uh, with their people. They don't know quite where they stand, what they can do, and what they can't do. I think in terms of transparency, Hackle is right. We need to get this deal out in the open where people can look at it before it's a done deal. What do you think, Stephen? I, well, I mean, I, I don't have any problem with, uh, trans uh, with transparency, with having the numbers out on the table for everybody to vet. I, my concern is that Mark Hackle and uh, Brooks Patterson, to some extent, have pushed themselves into a corner on this on this thing uh, to where if it does happen, it's almost like uh, they've pushed themselves out on, on a tree limb uh, and expecting what, that, that somehow they That they're on survive. the wrong side of history on this, I, on the wrong I side think, of a decision? I think that's a possibility. There's no question that we've got to do something really different with DWSD that MOU was a was a very good start at uh, building a new infrastructure for dealing with water uh, I'm not sure that the, the objections that they have are reasonable uh, reasons to sort of abandon that this idea that somehow uh, customers will not have to pay more. That's that's yeah, fantasy. Yeah, but the MOU um, hurt itself by implying that rates would be capped at 4% a year, and boom, right out of the chute. Well, they would be capped from DWSD. It's and, the locals who might be doing that. That's where the people see the impact. And right away, folks got an average 11% 11, 11 increase. The trust here is almost non-existent. The suburbs still feel like that $50 million lease payment is going to be um, a bailout for Detroit. Uh, Brooks is trying to put real strict limits on how it can be spent. Duggan's objecting to that. Yeah. And these people got a lot to work out in a little bit of time. And if they don't get this in terms of the deadline, Stephen, where do we go from there? Th they'd Just have to go back it. to the, they'd have to go back to the drawing board. New I mean, MOU. if the MOU dies, you have to start from scratch. That sets us back months, if not uh, another year. I don't think that, that's not progress. And I don't think uh, any of these guys' constituents would say that was a great solution either. All right. Stephen Henderson, Nolan Finley. Thanks, guys. We'll expect you here tomorrow night for the wrap-up show. Last show. The last show. All right, well, Mike Rowe, the host of CNN, Somebody's Gotta Do It, was in town for a second day to talk about his new partnership with the state. He's helping to promote the important role of the skilled trades in Michigan's economic growth. Early in 2009, late in 2008, the economy obviously took an ugly turn. And uh, the headlines everywhere were about very high unemployment, 10, 11, 12, 13 percent. But on my show, everywhere I went, I saw help wanted signs. And it just made me think, what a, what a curious uh, narrative, or a tale of two narratives, really, going on contemporaneously. We have a widening skills gap at the same time we have rising unemployment. And I just started to wonder, what's really informing that? You know? And I talked to a lot of the employers who, who opened up their sets for us, including the Bridge Authority. And, um, and the answer really was kind of obvious. They, there was just no great enthusiasm for a whole category of jobs and a whole category of education that we typically call alternative. So how do you change that mindset? <laughs> you need about 40 years <laughs> and you need a steady diet of cultural messages that consistently challenge the stigmas and stereotypes that currently live. I think we have to challenge the country's relationship with work if we want to if we want to challenge the definition of a good job in 2015. Mike Rowe's a great guy. And by the way, his first job was as an opera singer at the Baltimore Opera, and he actually sang for me on the set. You can see that online at myvote.org. And finally tonight, Mackinac Island is an idyllic place with about 500 permanent residents. And since the island is car free, the guys at Under the Radar Michigan decided to find out how goods are actually delivered to the locals.
Hey, it's me again, Tom Dalton from Under the Radar, Michigan. Now, during the off season, only about 600 people live on the island. But during the summers, thousands of people come to this beautiful place. And we all know how the tourists get here, but have you ever wondered how everything else gets here? Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, you guys really are the rock stars of the island because we all see the tourists coming and going, but I don't think people realize the tremendous amount of work it takes to bring everything we all need onto the island. Absolutely. We do many things behind the scenes. Uh, a lot of people don't think about that. We haul everything from the beverages and food for the restaurants and hotels, supplies for businesses over here. We've been doing this for a long time, over 100 years. We started with freight and uh, we're proud to be in this business. Yeah, you guys really do bring everything on the island, including the kitchen sink. Absolutely, just for you. Well, thank, that's mine, awesome. Yes. Now the policy conference is going on right now. Do you bring anything special for that? Yes, we do. We uh, brought over all of the audio and visual equipment, uh, some of their sponsors, supplies. We were pretty busy Memorial Weekend bringing everything over for this conference. For conference yeah. Speaking of freight, I ordered a five gallon drum of mustache wax. Did that make it onto the island? Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, well, I'll check. Okay. <laughs> So next time you're on the island, think about all the people whose job it is to get everything you need over here. And as for finding your way home, that's pretty much your job. And that is going to do it for this edition of My Vote Mackinac. We're so glad that you joined us. We hope you tune in again tomorrow night at 730. In the meantime, you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, head to myvote.org for more on the Mackinac Policy Conference. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.